All right, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Karen Brownlee, and I am the Adult Program Coordinator at the North Suburban YMCA. As part of the social responsibility portion of the WISE mission statement, I started the adult education series four years ago and was lucky enough to meet Matt Margolis at the time, and he has been a part of the series ever since, offering monthly presentations about areas of elder law that might be of interest to you. In the adult education series, we offer an average of eight programs a month, bringing in experts like Matt to talk to you about their areas of expertise and topics that might be of interest to you. For example, on Monday of this week, we had a program discussing finding senior living during a pandemic. Next Tuesday, we'll begin a six month meditation practice program. We also have a nutrition presentation next week and we're covering advocating for your ailing loved one during the pandemic the following week. We'll finally wrap up the month with a doctor from Illinois Bone and Joint covering neck, back and spine pain. Today, Matt will be discussing understanding Medicaid and how to legally protect your assets. Matt is an elder law attorney with a practice in Park Ridge. He's also a Y member. And I like to think that he moved to Northbrook after he started participating in the adult education series so that he could get closer to and become a member of our Y. We're recording today's program and we'll post it on our virtual Y so that members can have access to it later. If you could please mute yourself throughout the presentation so that everyone can easily hear Matt, we would appreciate it. However, when you have questions, feel free to raise your hand and unmute yourself and ask Matt when he has a little break. The adult education series is always free and open to the public. And if you would like to sign up to learn about our programs each month, please email me. I'll put my email address in the chat box. And if you'd like to make a donation to the Y in appreciation of this free series, you can also email me and I can help you do that. Thank you, Matt, for your commitment to the why. Thanks for joining us today. And thank you everyone for being here today. Matt, I will let you take it from here. Thanks, Karen. That was oh so formal. Um, <laughs> Happy New Year, everybody. Um, thanks for tuning in today. I've got like, a, I've got a full screen here. Um, it's like an expanded Brady Bunch. Um, well, I hope everybody's doing well and staying healthy. And um, I feel like it's, it's getting, it's too normal, but still weird to, to almost keep on saying, I hope everybody's healthy all the time. Something that we never used to say in the past, um, but probably not a bad thing to can continue to say. Um, so my name is Matt Margolis, as Karen mentioned. My partner, Lauren Weldon, and I have a, a boutique elder law and estate planning practice in downtown Park Ridge. Um, so we help folks with wills, trust, powers of attorney, special needs planning, asset protection, um, we do a lot of asset protection related to Medicaid. The vast majority of what we do uh, from an asset protection side is related to Medicaid and long-term care, um, sort of helping folks sort of navigate uh, the whole long-term care um, maze, if you will, um, really focusing on the legal end, but you know, being uh, what we like to think of being, being pretty good quarterbacks or resources for all of those other needs that aren't necessarily um, related to the legal field. Um, you know, we've got a nice big network of folks that, that help with a lot of other things. So, all right, Medicaid and asset protection. Um, this tends to be a hot topic. So I'm, I'm glad to see everybody on here. Um, as Karen mentioned, I am, uh, you know, my presentation style is very um, conversational. Um, you know, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna be showing you any slides um, it's just going to be me talking. If, as Karen mentioned, if you have questions, um, you know, for those of you that are that are that are brave enough to show me your faces, if you could just kind of raise your hand like this, and I might give you one of these. I'm not trying to be rude, but you know, I, I want I'm going to want to finish my train of thought sometimes, um, so that I don't forget where I'm going because I do that pretty often. Um, for those of you that are not showing your video. I would ask that maybe you type something in the chat box and, and just note that you have a question um, or you can feel free to type your question. You know, every, anybody can feel free to type their question into the chat box. And then when I have a minute, you know, I'll, I'll take a look down there and, and if nothing else, we'll cover those questions at the end. Um, you know, I think the chat box is a great place to sort of, um, you know, get people to, to put their questions out there so that they don't forget about them, right? Because if you're like me, you'll forget about it two minutes later. I think I covered most of the house rules, so why don't we jump in? Um, so before we start looking at it and, and discussing any sort of, um, and the last thing I would say is actually, if people, uh, if everybody can mute themselves, um, I would really appreciate it just because, you know, there, there might be, there's already I can tell there's some background noise on some of, uh, from some of you. Don't know who it's coming from exactly, but if we all mute ourselves that way, um, you know, we can all uh, sort of, 
but we don't have any kind of distraction in the back. Um, all right, let's talk about Medicaid first and then we can get into the asset protection piece, right? Because we sort of have to understand how Medicaid works first. So there's different forms of Medicaid in Illinois. All right, we have what we sort of refer to as community Medicaid or um, ACA Medicaid, right? Affordable Care Act. Um, we're not gonna be discussing that on today's call. That's really, you know, sort of, that's like the health insurance Medicaid, right? That's the Medicaid that covers up, co covers folks that are living um, at, you know, in their own home, renting an apartment. And, um, you know, they're, they're living probably, for the most part, they're probably living sort of un under close to the poverty level and, and they need that form of Medicaid really as a form of health insurance. That's not what today's talk is going to be about. Today, we're, we are going to be discussing what we refer to as long-term care Medicaid. Um, uh, the way that long-term care Medicaid works. So first we'll talk about if I'm a single individual and how Medicaid works, then we'll talk about how it applies for a married couple. If I'm a single person moving into a, a skilled nursing facility in Illinois, all right, and there's two types of places in Illinois that take Medicaid. Supportive living facilities, okay? Supportive living, and this is not assisted living. I wanna be very clear. Any place that is called assisted living is going to be private pay and they will not take Medicaid at all. Okay, so supportive living. Um, and supportive living is, is a very similar-ish level of care to assisted living, just to give you some context. Uh, supportive living and then skilled nursing, skilled nursing facilities. Now, just so you know, every single place in Illinois that is called a supportive living facility takes Medicaid, every single one. It's not like some do and some don't. Every place that's classified as supportive living accepts Medicaid. When it comes to skilled nursing facilities, not every single one takes Medicaid, right? There are some around here. So for most, I, I presume most of the people on this call um, are, you know, live somewhat in, in the area. Um, I think I noticed one name that, that might not live in the area, but used to. Um, and so I can't speak for, for anywhere outside of the immediate area, but in general, you know, within like a 15, 20 mile radius of, of Northbrook, let's say, there are tons of skilled nursing facilities that take Medicaid. I would argue that there are more skilled nursing facilities that accept Medicaid than those that don't. Now, again, I'm talking about a skilled nursing facility. I'm not talking about memory care. I'm not talking about assisted living. Um, to be very honest, the only one I can think of within really a five mile radius, to some extent, that does not take Medicaid is um, Whitehall. So, you know, if anybody's driven by Whitehall on, on Waukegan, not too far from Carson's Ribs for those Ribs fans, um, Whitehall is a private pay nursing facility, skilled nursing facility, right? But the majority of the ones around us do take Medicaid. All right. Um, so I move into a nursing home and I want to apply for Medicaid. And so the way that it works is med the Medicaid or the state says, Matt, as a single person, you can have $2,000 in total assets in your name. Now, what does the $2,000 include? People always ask me, literally everything. Okay, it includes checkings, checking accounts, savings accounts, IRAs, 401ks, 403bs, money markets, brokerage, stocks, bonds, annuities. It includes the cash value of life insurance policies and it includes real estate. Um, it includes all of those things, right? So I have to be under $2,000. If I'm under $2,000 in assets, now I'm not talking about income yet, so we're not talking about social security, we'll get into that. But if, as long as I have less than $2,000, even if I own a home, I can still apply for Medicaid, but what happens is the state has the right to put a lien on my house. And so, and then they want me to sell it. And they're going to put pressure on me to sell it. And so eventually when the house sells, well, guess what? The house sells eight months later. Now I have $250,000 in my name. Well, now I have to spend down all that money at the nursing home until it's gone or down to $2,000 and then I can get back on Medicaid. Okay. So um, thank you for whoever, for whoever just muted yourself. Uh, got a lot more quiet. Um, so at that point, now I'm back on Medicaid, right? But I'm going to be temporarily off Medicaid until the proceeds of the sale of the home are gone, right? Or, or, or dwindled down to $2,000.
there are a there are a few very very remote sort of exceptions to uh, a single person being able to sort of protect the house okay with not without doing any kind of pre-planning for the most part so if i own a home in joint tenancy with an adult with with a sibling of mine and that sibling has been residing in the house for at least the last year i can transfer the house solely to that sibling of mine and i don't have to sell it okay pretty remote carve out i think we'd all agree right um it you know i've been doing this for 10 years i've maybe seen one or two clients where they're moving into a nursing home applying for medicaid they've been living they, they've been living with and owning it's not just living with sorry it's that they own the house in joint tenancy with their sibling okay I think we'd all agree that's something that we're probably not going to find to be a, a pretty a pretty often uh, something that occurs often. Um, the other carve out, which we've had a couple times, is where we have an adult child living in the home. Now it's a child, not a grandchild, an adult child living in the home with me in this example and taking care of me for at least two years, up until the time that I move out and apply for Medicaid. We call it the child caregiver exemption. And in that situation, the child does not have to be on title of the home with me. And what I can do is I can actually um, quit claim and transfer the house to my son or daughter in that example and still apply for Medicaid. And there's no issue with me giving them the house. Right, and sort of the, the idea or the public policy behind this is that, um, you know, this person, if it, you know, but for my, my son or daughter living with me and taking care of me, it might have been likely that I would have applied for Medicaid two years ago or three years ago, right? I've got some situations where I have an adult child living with a, with a client for eight years taking care of them before it just gets to a point where it's too much and they can't handle it anymore, right? So the state says, all right, well, this is their home, right? This son or daughter has literally doesn't have an apartment, doesn't have some other home they live in. This has been their home. They've prevented this person from applying for Medicaid sooner. We're going to let this single individual transfer the house to the son or daughter. Um, again, these things happen. I'd say they're pretty few and far between. Um, again, I've been doing this for, for 10, almost 11 years now. Between both of these exemptions, maybe I've seen it happen three or four times. Maybe. Um, all right, so we've I've got a two thousand dollar asset limit, and then from an income standpoint, this is where there's a little bit of a difference between a supportive living facility and a skilled nursing facility. If I'm moving into a supportive living facility, I can keep ninety dollars a month of my income. If I'm in a skilled nursing facility, I get to keep thirty dollars a month of my income. The remainder of my income is going to go to the facility, and then Medicaid or the state will pick up the rest of the tab. Now, if I have a Medicare supplement or any kind of, you know, RX, any kind of drug plan, I can continue to pay for those. And so I would pay for those, in my supplement, pay for my drug plan, keep my, if I'm in a skilled nursing, keep my $30, and then the remainder of whatever my income is would go to the nursing home. Okay, now, I would, you know, I think a lot of us would agree. I mean, income for, for the most part, if, if I'm moving into a nursing home, is probably going to be some form of or a combination of Social Security and, and a pension. Right? So if I'm moving into a nursing home, I'm not working anymore. Or pretty, pretty unlikely that I'm still working. The last thing that we look at is what, what's called the look back. So Medicaid has a look back. And if anybody has done any kind of research on Medicaid, this is probably something that you, you, you've come across. Medicaid has a five-year look back. And what does that mean? That means that when I go to apply for Medicaid, Medicaid wants to know what did I do with my assets over the last five years? And really what they're concerned with is did I give any money away? That's what they care about. So it doesn't matter that I bought a $10,000 flat screen TV. It doesn't matter that I went on a $50,000 around the world, you know, trip three years ago. Um, they don't care about those things. They're fine with that. What they care about is, did I write my daughter a check for 
right? Did I give money away? Because in Medicaid's eyes, if I'm giving money away, I'm doing it for the purpose of making myself eligible for Medicaid. Now, in the in the Medicaid policy, it actually says that you know any what the, what the, the term that they use is a transfer for less than fair market value. Any transfer for less than fair market value, in anticipation of applying for Medicaid, is is prohibited. Now, I can tell you that I've worked with plenty of clients where they did not give money away in anticipation of applying for Medicaid. Right? They were helping their son who was going through a divorce with his attorney's fees. They were helping their daughter who was out of work pay her rent. They were, God forbid, paying for guitar lessons for their nephew or horseback riding lessons for their granddaughter. All of these things would be considered gifts. Even though we would argue they were not done in anticipation of Medicaid, right? Because unfortunately we have plenty of clients that we've worked with that had a stroke out of nowhere and ended up in a nursing home. They were hardly anticipating needing nursing care at age 71 or 68 in another case. One second, Barbara. But these things happen. And so when these gifts are made, unfortunately, the reality is it doesn't matter what the policy says that you know these were done in anticipation of Medicaid. The reality is it's a gift or a transfer for less than fair market value is a transfer for less than fair market value. And it's going to count against us. And I will explain how that works. Barbara, why don't you unmute yourself and ask me the question you have? Barbara, you need to unmute yourself. If you actually... Just a tip for everybody, if you hold okay. down, if you hold down the space bar, it allows you to unmute yourself. And if you hold it well, down- it now says, uh, can you hear me now? I can. Yeah, okay. Well, this business about not allowed to give gifts. Okay, uh, my sister is 99. She has just recently gone into skilled nursing and, um, um, I'm her uh, power of attorney and all that stuff. And uh, I do know that um, her trust says that at some point, uh, whoever is doing serving in this capacity is entitled to, and it's a vague term, but um, Reasonable uh, compensation. I'm just wondering um, how that figures into it. I have not taken anything as of yet. So. Okay. Is that honored? So good question. And I, it makes me, makes me realize I forgot one very important housekeeping rule. And Barbara, you're my guinea pig. So I'll answer your question. But then after this, um, I'd okay. say any, any personal questions, guys, I really can't take. Um, I, I, I really prefer not to answer during this. I see. Only because okay. it sort of takes away from the rest of the group. I prefer general questions that just sort of relate to something I just discussed. That's, again, very general. Um, even though we can sort of relate this and we can make this, we can, we can make this a little more general. So I'll answer this one, but in the future, I'd say if we can just sort of, sort of clarify, um, you know, some of the, some of what I'm talking about, I pu I'll put my information in the chat box, you know, anybody feel free to shoot me an email or give me a call. I'm happy to uh, set up times to talk after, uh, after the fact. I would say that um, reasonable compensation uh, you know, when somebody's acting as a trustee of a trust or as power of attorney for property, um, those documents, so really any, any trust we draft and, and the statutory power of attorney in Illinois, it's, it allows the trustee or the, or the power of attorney to be compensated. Again, and typically the term is reasonable compensation for, you know, them stepping in and being a trustee or being a power of attorney. And so as long as records are being kept, and I'm keeping records saying, you know, listen, I spent 30 minutes at the bank dealing with the banker, you know, as trustee of my sister's trust, or I, I spent, you know, an hour as power of, in my role as power of attorney doing this or doing that. As long as there's records being kept in, in when we're handling, when we're stepping into those roles and the, the compensation is reasonable, $20 an hour, $30 an hour, something of that nature, there's no issues. It's when we don't have any records and we're just writing ourselves checks and you know we're not able to really account for the time we're spending, that would be something that would be an issue. So as long as as long as records are being kept, I don't I don't see an issue with it. Records? 
like like <laughs> never, right, so i just I, I i just mentioned and i'm not going to go into yeah, too much right. more detail barbara but you got to keep a time log basically that's what i mean by records you got to keep a time log of, of what's going to happen okay thank you yeah, okay <laughs> sarah Um, are, are certain trusts, can certain trusts be set up in such a way as to protect the assets of the estate from Medicaid claiming those assets, for instance, revocable trusts set up in a, but if they're in your name and it's a revocable trust, is that still viewed as a, as an asset of the estate? Sarah, great, great question. You, you're, you're, you're a step ahead of me. So I'm going to, I'm not going to totally answer it other than saying, Yes, there are trusts that can protect assets, and that is a huge th part of what we're going to talk about today. Um, so you've done your research or know enough to be dangerous. But I will say, in general, a revocable trust. So for anybody out there that has a revocable trust, those do not protect assets from Medicaid. A revocable trust, which we draft many of, those are great planning devices for a lot of people. I would say for the vast majority of people but really as a planning device to ensure that our assets pass on to our beneficiaries in a way where we can avoid probate and not go through the court system and, and you know, sort of deal with a, a more personal private estate administration um, versus putting a will together. So revocable trusts are great, but they do not protect assets in, the, in this scenario where we're trying to protect them from Medicaid. So we'll talk about, but that is the type of, we'll get into that, Sarah, we'll talk about that trust today. Like I said, that'll be a big part of what we'll discuss. Um, so we have this five-year look back period. And, and when I said tr transfers for less than fair market value, the other thing I want to note is, you know, Medicaid is going to consider some of, any of us would, would probably agree. If I write my son a check for $10,000, that's a gift. If I write my daughter a check, a check for $20,000, that's a gift. However, if I sold my son, my car that was worth 20,000 for $5,000, none of us would call that a gift. We would just say, you know, some, we're, we're, giving our, we're giving our kid a good deal, right? Medicaid would say, that's a $15,000 transfer for less than fair market value. The car had a fair market value of 20,000. You sold it for five. Effectively, you gave away $15,000, right? Because I have clients all the time that say, what if I just sold my house to my daughter for $100? And I said, well, your house is worth 300,000. So you gave away $299,900 if you did that. And that's how Medicaid is going to look at it. We can, we can say this isn't fair and I, and, I can, and I can agree to a large extent, but these are just the rules. Um, and unfortunately, right, it's, I'd argue that 99.99999% of people aren't reviewing and studying up on the Medicaid policy over the course of their lifetime up until the point when either they or a loved one gets sick and the idea of Medicaid starts to become a reality that they never thought it would have prior. Right, And so unfortunately, what happens is we're all of a sudden in a situation where we might have done things that we had no idea how they impact, that, they, that, they, you know, that, that by taking this action, it was going to negatively impact me from a Medicaid standpoint. It stinks. It's just the way it is. I wish I had a better answer. Um, now let's look at a married couple. All right, so my wife and I are married. Now I'm going into the nursing home. Everything I just stated about me as a single person still applies. I can have no more than $2,000 in my name individually. I can keep no more than $30 a month of my income. And the five-year look back applies. Now my wife, right, or my spouse that's living at home, she can have $109,560 of assets. Now, a lot of this information I'm giving you guys, some of these details about the numbers, et cetera, um, I would, I would say that, again, I'll type my information in the chat box. I'll also make sure I get it to Karen. I've got an, I, I do have an outline that'll have some of this information. I don't like to give it out ahead of time, but I do have some of this. So if anybody's interested, you can email Karen or, or email me and I'll, I'll send it over. Um, not saying you shouldn't take notes, but just, just letting you know that, that I can send something to supplement uh, maybe the notes you're taking. Um, so my wife can have $109,560 in assets. She can have a house and Medicaid doesn't, they have, there's no provisions as to what the, what the value of the house can be. It can be a $150,000 condo. It can be a $900,000 house. Doesn't matter. And then she can have a car. 
So $109,560 a house and a car. My wife can have $2,739 a month of income, $2,739. Now Medicaid considers that a minimum. I'm not gonna go into great detail on this, but in general, what that means is if her income is more than that. So what if my wife has a, maybe she's still working. Maybe she has a really nice pension because she was a teacher or in law enforcement or a firefighter, right? Those are where we see some of these big pensions, right? I've had clients with seven, $8,000 pensions or more. And so the way that it works is she gets to keep the 2739, but anything over that, Medicaid's gonna basically take a small percentage of it and it's gonna have to be contributed towards my care. Sarah, one second. Um, it, it's, it's, there's an algorithm for it. I'm not gonna go through it right now, but just know that there, there is a small percentage of that of what she has over that would have to be used for my care. And in that, uh, in that same example, all of my income would have to go to the nursing home if her income is over the 2739. Now, that's pretty rare. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. It's very rare. What is more common is that let's say my wife, what if my wife's income is $1,500 a month and my income is 2000? Well, what I can do is I can actually, I can keep my $30, I can pay for my Medicare supplement, I can pay for my drug plan, and then I can transfer income to my wife to get her up to 2739. Okay, so I can kind of fill the gap. If she's below that, I can fill the gap for her to get up to, get up to that. And then whatever I have left after I've kind of filled the gap for her, paid my Medicare supplement, paid my drug plan, kept my $30, anything I have left at that point will go to the nursing home. Okay. Sarah, go ahead. Sarah, you got to unmute yourself. Does disability income count? Yes. Okay, thanks. Yep, no problem. Um, and, and that's a good question, Sarah. Any, any form of income counts. So even long-term care insurance. Long-term care insurance is going to be considered income. Um, now, that's not a terrible thing. A lot is those folks that have long-term care insurance, in some cases, it prevents them from having to apply for Medicaid for a certain period of time, right? And so they're able to use that income to help pay for their care, you know, in some cases, maybe they're going to be in a, uh, and I always say this with a grain of salt, a more desirable nursing home, um, you know, that, that maybe takes, takes private pay only and no Medicaid. You know, in general, I will say that a nursing home at the end of the day is a nursing home. I'm not, I'm not trying to be a downer here. Um, but, you know, I would say that most of us, if I, if I, if I asked everybody to raise their hands and said, who would love to move into a nursing home tomorrow? I don't care if it's, a, you know, one of the nicer nursing homes, nobody's probably raising their hand saying, oh yeah, I would love to. Um, you know, that's just, it's just, you know, it's not what we want, but it's, it's just a, a reality for a lot of folks. Um, um, so, all right, I wanna try to get back to my train of thought. Okay, so we're talking about income for, uh, for the spouse. And then the last thing is that the five-year look back period applies to both of us. Okay, so it's not as if, you know, as if my wife gave away, you know, if, if she was gifting assets from an account in her name that was in her name only, it doesn't count as a gift. It does. It doesn't matter if the accounts are in her name or my name or joint accounts. Any money that we, either one of us gave, gave away will impact my Medicaid, okay? Um, my... The way that, sorry, the way that Medicaid works is, and really quick here, what I'm gonna do is, I'm just gonna put my email in the chat box because if anybody has a personal question, I would rather you email it to me than put it in the chat box because I'm, I'm, I'm really, I just wanna be upfront, I will not respond to any personal questions in the, in the chat box because I, I can't do it as I'm talking and when I'm done talking, I'm ultimately gonna be, I gotta hop off and, and get into a meeting. So um, somebody did just email me a question, I'm not gonna say your name, but I just put my email in there. So if you can, if you can just shoot that to me as an email, I'd appreciate it and I'd be happy to answer it. Um, so the way that the penalty works from a Medicaid standpoint is Medicaid basically takes, um, for a nursing home, is they take the amount of the money that was gifted within the last five years. And it doesn't matter if it was two weeks ago or four years ago. There's no 
prorated, you know, uh, situation here where they, oh, it happened four years ago. So we're only going to, you know, consider 80%, you know, consider 20% of, of the gift is affecting you. Um, the way that it works is if I gave away $100,000 and the cost of care at the nursing home is 10000 a month, they're going to say, you gave away 100000 we're going to divide that by the cost, the monthly cost of care, which is $10,000 a month. You gave away 10 months worth of care. So even though today, Matt, you have $2,000 in your name and your wife has $109,560 in a house and a car, and you would otherwise be eligible today, because you gave away 10 months of, of care, you need to private pay for the next 10 months out of pocket. After that, then Medicaid will kick in. So the way it would work is I would actually get approved for Medicaid, but with a 10 month penalty. Okay. Not an ideal situation. I think we'd all agree, especially because if we're applying for Medicaid, most of us, if we gave money away, we probably will have a hard time getting it back. Right. Unless we truly gave it away to our kids and they were literally holding on to it and they didn't spend it and they didn't use it for anything and they could get it back to us before we'd apply then we can sort of undo the gift. But for the most part, we're going to be, you know, a lot of times we're sort of between a rock and a hard place. And I won't, I really won't go down that path other, other, other than it's a, it is a very uphill battle to, to try to somehow get rid of that 10 month penalty in that situation if we don't have the money to pay for it. Um, what I, the only difference between a nursing home and a supportive living facility is a supportive living facility. They don't take the monthly cost of care as the, we'll call it a, a penalty divisor, if you will, right? So if, I'm, if it's costing $10,000 a month and I gave away 100,000, the $10,000 that we sort of call is the, the divisor, the penalty divisor, right? That's how they're calculating the penalty. If I'm in supportive living, they don't take the monthly cost of care at that specific supportive living facility there's a fixed amount, sort of a daily amount that kind of works out to a monthly amount as what they use for the divisor. I don't have it, I don't, can't tell you what it is offhand. It's about 50, between 50, 200 and 50, 500 a month is what they use as the divisor for, for supportive living. And so it doesn't matter if the supportive living facility that I'm in costs 3,500 a month or 6,000 a month, they use that, they use that single divisor no matter what. Okay, so we've talked about sort of the Medicaid numbers. We've talked about the, uh, how a penalty works. We're gonna get into the asset protection piece. Before I do that, Mark, or S Mark, uh, I'll take your question. Okay, so this you're probably gonna go into, but uh, earlier you kind of mentioned about the, ero ero um, you know, about trust. Irrevocable trust. Help, and, but then that's not the one that protects your assets, but a trust, uh, a different trust, I think you had said, would protect your assets. So I guess the question is how, how long does that have to be in place to protect your assets? So let's say if my parents were going into a facility and then they decide, okay, let's get this set up. And then a month or two later, something happens and they go in, is that protected or it's not because it hasn't been five years or something like that? Mark, it's exact, or I'm, at, I'm saying Mark, maybe it's probably, maybe that's not your first name. That's exactly where I'm going to go right now. Okay. So we're, we're right on the same page. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Um, the, before I get into that, there's one piece I really want to just throw in there um, before I forget, because I, I look at this as being extremely important for people to understand. Um, I think a lot of people sort of get confused about and sort of mix up the terms when it comes to Medicare and Medicaid. And so I just want to spend like three to five minutes on this and then we'll get it and then we'll be asset protection all the way for the next 20 minutes, 25 minutes. When I go into a, uh, if I go into the hospital, okay, something happens, I fall, I, I, I break my collarbone, I break my hip and I'm in the hospital um, and I'm, I'm there and then I get discharged for rehab. In most cases, or in a lot of cases, that rehab is going to be covered by Medicare, okay? However, for us to have Medicare cover the rehab, and again, and, and the one thing I do want to say here is Medicare only covers rehab. Medicare does not, is not a solution for long-term care needs. Medicare is going to cover a short period of rehab and that's it. Okay, just want to say that. 
But for Medicare to cover my rehab, I need to have three overnights as inpatient status in a hospital. I need to be inpatient. I can't, you know, and a lot of us think, oh, if I spend three nights in the hospital, of course I'm inpatient. Not necessarily. I've had clients have seven days in a hospital overnight, and four of those days were under, they were under observation, and they weren't inpatient status. I'm not a medical professional. I can't speak to how and why they determine that somebody's inpatient versus under observation, but I can tell you that this is extremely important. You need three inpatient overnights in a hospital before being discharged to rehab, typically at a nursing home, for Medicare to cover it. Okay, so if I was there for 10, 10 nights, great. At least three of them needed to be inpatient. And then the way it works from a Medicare covering rehab standpoint, Medicare will cover the first 20 days at 100%. For another up for up to another 80 days, so for a total of 100, for up to another 80 days after the first 20, Medicare will cover 80%. And if I have a Medicare like a true Medicare supplement, my supplement will tip will cover the other 20%. And so I could potentially not have any out of pocket for up to 100 days. Now, a Medicare Advantage plan works differently, and I can't speak to the details because a lot of those kind of work a little bit differently, but with a Medicare Advantage plan, I can tell you that there are some gaps in coverage during that, during that remaining 80, during those remaining 80 days, and there could be some days where there are going to be some out-of-pocket costs for that 20% that Medicare doesn't cover. So one thing I'd recommend is that anybody that has a Medicare supplement or Medicare Advantage plan probably not a bad idea to talk to the person who you who you worked with to purchase the plan and find out how your plan works right if it's if it's a supplement typically the supplement will cover that 20 percent i've never seen like a true supplement that doesn't but with the advantage plans they work a little bit differently and there definitely could be some gaps um the one thing I, the last thing i want to say on this note is that well first of all if you've got a loved one in the hospital you need to be asking on a daily basis, what's their status? You need, you need to know that information. You need to know whether they're under observation or inpatient. Because sometimes if they're gonna be under observation, maybe you can plea with them and say, listen, why are they under observation? They should be inpatient. And you know, there are advocates that, that we put clients in touch with that can help work with them and sort of you know, kindly argue or petition on their behalf with the hospital saying, I don't, why are they under observation? They should be inpatient, right? And these are medical professionals and they know the language and they know the, they know that world. And so they know how to, you know, they know when a person should be inpatient versus observation. Listen, the hospitals get, you know, the majority of the money that these hospitals receive is from Medicare. They've got a vested interest to not have everybody be inpatient because if everybody's inpatient all the time and then they all go to rehab and Medicare is covering them, guess what? Medicare is coming back to that hospital and saying, hey, what the heck guys? Every single person that leaves your hospital is inpatient status and we're covering their rehab. You've got to fix this, right? So I'm not saying the hospitals are doing anything wrong, but you know, in a gray area, they might push somebody more to observation than inpatient because of this, right? They want to keep Medicare happy. All right, asset protection. So when we look to protect assets, there's sort of two ways that we can do it. And... Um, and the question that uh, just, I guess I'll say S. Mark asked um, is, was a perfect one because there's sort of two ways that we can plan. One is where we believe we have five years on our side. Okay, we kind of look at this as pre-planning, right? What if one of us, if I'm, in a married, if I'm a married couple, what if one of us needs care down the road? We want to make sure that we can protect our assets, right? In a lot of cases, I want to protect assets because if I need a nursing home care, I want to make sure that my wife maybe has more than $109,000 down the road, right? I don't want all of our money to be spent on my care, and then she's left with $100,000, and I get on Medicaid at that point, right? And so is there something we can do to protect our assets five years in advance? Um, and then there's sort of the other, the other type of planning is, you know, we don't have five years on our side right? My, my wife or my husband or my dad or my mom just had a stroke. It came out of nowhere. Now we need to plan. Or honestly, the reality is 95% of the people, 
we are not a proactive culture. And, 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 and even worse than that, what I'm talking about today, a very, very small percentage of people know that there's any ability to protect assets in general, right? That's just the way it is, unfortunately. As much as we try to get out there and educate, people just don't know that there, that there are these options. And so people really don't find out about them until the last minute, right? So let's talk about a five, you know, we have five years on our side. Um, I mean, the one thing I'll say is long-term care insurance is great. So for those of you that can afford it and you're still young enough and healthy enough to be able to apply for it, it's something that's great to look into. I am a huge advocate for long-term care insurance. And nowadays there are policies that, you know, I think a lot of people have got, were, were worried at one point that because a lot of these policies are sort of use it or lose it, right? You were paying into this long-term care insurance policy for years, maybe twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 of premiums. And the fear was, well, what if I never go into a nursing home or I never have a caregiver at home? I just wasted all that money. I get it. Most of us don't get mad that we, that our house doesn't burn down or that we don't get in a car accident and we paid for property insurance and auto insurance every year for the last 40 years. Most of us don't consider that a loss, but I would argue that it's pretty similar, right? So um, long-term care insurance, if you can get it, great. That's all I'll say. And I don't, and I don't sell it. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not throwing myself out there as, uh, as an agent to work with. Um, so five years in advance, what do we do? Well, we use, so what we do, and there are different attorneys that do different things, but I'd say what's very common is that we use an irrevocable trust, okay? We call it, in our office, we call it a Medicaid asset protection trust. That's because people aren't really coming to us saying, hey, Matt, I'm in a really risky line of work and I wanna protect my assets in case somebody sues me. And that's not really what we do. That's not, that's not our specialty. You know, these are, these trusts that we're putting together really are for purposes of, are we trying to protect our assets for Medicaid? So the way that it works is, so if anybody's familiar with a revocable trust, okay, I'll be very quick on how a revocable trust works. A revocable living trust, again, like I said before, great at protecting our assets from probate after we pass away and making sure that everything we have goes to our, our beneficiaries in the manner that we want them to get it. But there's no asset protection with a revocable trust because with a revocable trust, I am what's called the trust maker. I'm the one creating it. Some of you may be more familiar with the term grantor, settlor. These all mean the same thing. We use the term trust maker in our office because it's exactly what it sounds like. I'm the one making the trust. So if my wife and I are the trust makers of our trust and we are the trustees, the trustees of the trust are who gets to control the assets that are in the trust, right? So we create a trust, we retitle our house into the trust. We retitle our bank accounts at Fifth Third Bank into the trust. We retitle our investments at JP Morgan into the trust. As trustees, we get to deal with all those bank accounts and those financial accounts and, and our house, just like we did before we had a trust in place. And it operates off our social security number and our life hasn't really changed in any material way at all. And we are the lifetime beneficiaries, right? The trust is for our benefit during our lifetime. It is only for the benefit of our children when we pass away, even though they might think otherwise. Um, the way that an irrevocable trust works and to get asset protection is we have to give up a couple things, right? It'd be too good to be true, if I said, oh yeah, I can still be in control of all my money, I can be the beneficiary, but by the way, Medicaid, you can't touch it. Doesn't work that way, right? So the way that we protect assets with an irrevocable trust is that I cannot be the trustee. My wife and I, neither one of us can be the trustee of the trust. We're still the ones creating it. We're still the trust makers. And without going into a ton of detail, just for the sake of time, it can still operate off our social security number, but we are, We'll be the ones creating it, but we cannot be the trustees and we cannot be the lifetime beneficiaries. So 99% of the time, the way that these types of trusts are gonna work is that we're gonna have an adult child of ours be a trustee. And then typically our adult children will be the lifetime beneficiaries. Now they'll also be the beneficiaries when we pass away, right? We call those the residuary beneficiaries. Um, but our, our, one or more of our kids will be the trustee during our lifetime. And, and typically one or more of our children will be the lifetime beneficiaries. Let's talk about how this works in, you know, from a very practical standpoint. 
right? So my wife and I create this trust. I'd say, you know, again, we're, we're ideally doing this at a time where we feel like we've got at least five years on our side before we need long-term care, or at least we're keeping enough money outside of this trust that if we had a long-term care event arise in the next year or two, we could pay for it. How it's going to work is that, let's just say we put $200,000 in this trust, right? Our two, we got a $200,000 you know, brokerage account at, at Chase, and we're gonna put it in this trust. And my son's the trustee, and my son and my daughter are the lifetime beneficiaries. The question that we inevitably get, which obviously makes sense, is, well, what happens if we need the money, right? What happens if my wife and I end up needing the money at some point? Because all the money that we didn't put in that trust that was in our names, that we kept in our name, we ran out of. Well, we can still have access to the money that's in the trust, but we have to access it through our children. So the way it works is my son, who's the trustee, at some point I say, hey, buddy, you know what? Mom and dad or, or, or dad, dad needs $1,000 a month. Right. Until I say I don't, I need a thousand dollars a month. And so what we did, what we decide is, is my son is going to withdraw a thousand dollars from the trust. He's going to distribute, not withdraw. He's going to distribute as trustee to himself or to my daughter, right? His sister, a thousand dollars each month to one of them. That person, that child is then going to put the money in their bank account and then turn around and write me a check from their own personal bank account for a thousand dollars saying, dad, I love you so much. Here's a thousand dollars of your own money, um, right? I mean, that's really what it is. They're really just giving us our money back. Now, inevitably, before anybody asks, let's talk about how this works from a tax standpoint, right? Are there any taxes involved here? A distribution from a trust is not taxable. So if my son takes a check for $10,000 one month, deposits it, and then writes me a check for 10,000, it's not income to him. So he's not paying any income tax on that. However, when he turns around and he gives that money to me or my wife, that's a gift. And so what we need to be conscious of is how much is he gifting us or my daughter? How much is my daughter gifting us over the course of the year? So I don't want to say we all know, but just to let everybody know, the IRS says we can gift up to $15,000 a year to anybody and everybody we know. We don't pay any taxes on it. We don't have to report it to the IRS. And it doesn't come off of our lifetime exemption. Okay, in Illinois, as an Illinois resident, we all have the ability to gift during our lifetime or when we pass away. So, you know, when we when we when our kids inherit money from us, it's technically called a gift from, from an Illinois standpoint. We have the ability to gift up to four million dollars tax free. So as long as I'm staying, as long as we're all staying under that fifteen thousand dollars a year, as far as what we're giving to anybody, any one particular person, it doesn't come off of our four million dollar coupon, if you will. And we don't have to even tell the IRS about it. Okay, so in this example, with two children and with my wife and I, we could technically get $60,000 out of the trust in a, in a single year if we wanted to. Why? Because each one of them can give each one of us $15,000, right? My daughter can give each of us 15,000. My son can give each of us 15,000. Again, it's not that this is the end of the world. What if they had to give us more? one year. I mean, the, the downside would be if our kids are extremely successful and they had to be concerned about dipping into their $4 million exemption. I'm not saying that doesn't happen, but there are cases, a lot of cases where we're working with adult children, the adult children don't have that wonderful problem to have. And so the worst case scenario is that they have to file a gift tax return that year. They're not gonna pay any taxes on it, but they just have, they have to hire an accountant and file the gift tax return just to let the IRS know, hey, I gave my dad a check, you know, I wrote my dad a check for checks, you know, totaling $40,000 this year. Uh, ask Mark, I'll take this question. And then after this, I think it'll be my last one because I want to race through the material so we can get through everything. Okay. And in, in what you had just said, talking about with the trustee distributing funds from the trust to somebody, and then that money could be given to the parents. Do those people, so who, the trustee distributing that money, does that have to go to people who are trustees? You know, like let's say children, or it can go to anyone and then they can give? It has to go. So good question. So the it, it can only go to whoever's listed as a lifetime beneficiary on the trust. So if my son is the trustee 
And him and my daughter are both the lifetime beneficiaries. They are the only two people that my son as trustee can write checks to from the trust. Um, that's why it's, it's, it's not gonna always be the case. Sarah, I think I might have to hold off on the question. I really wanna, if you can write, type it up, please do. I wanna make sure I get through the material. Um, we only got about 10 minutes. I could probably squeeze this into 10, 20, maybe. Um, we wanna make, that's, that's why in some cases, if we only have one adult child, it can get tricky because if that one adult child who would be our only trustee and our only lifetime beneficiary doesn't survive us and something happens to him or her, now we are totally without a lifetime beneficiary and there's really no way to make up for that. So, um, but at the same time, you know, we are also pretty careful about who we do this planning with. I mean, I've had clients that, you know, they don't have any kids or they have kids that they have sort of pretty much alluded to the fact that they don't really trust. Well, then I don't want them involved in this planning. I mean, if, if we can't trust our kids or, you know, oh, I guess I could use my niece or nephew who I don't really know, I haven't talked to in 20 years, you know, it makes us a little more hesitant, even if the client wants to do it, because, you know, the big concern here is that if, if, if the niece or nephew wrote him or her, him or her, him or her, a check for $10,000 from the trust, and then we're trusting that they would give it back to their aunt or uncle, right? Our client, what if they don't? And if they didn't give it back, they wouldn't be breaking the rules of the trust, right? The rules say they are the beneficiaries. And if they gave themselves, they wrote themselves a check, they would be doing everything according to what the trust says. So we do have to be pretty careful with, with the planning. Um, we do have to really make sure that, um, you know, we've got the right people involved. And again, there's some situations where I've, you know, I've told clients, listen, if you find another attorney that wants to work with you, that's fine. I'm not trying to be mean. I just, I don't get a good feeling from the person that you're wanting to have involved in this. And, and I don't want this to come back where somebody's coming after us later, right? Just, just to be frank, um, it's pretty few and far between that that happens, right? Pretty, it's pretty uncommon that people are going to be, un, you know, they're going to be willing to name somebody in this role that they don't really trust very well. Um, so Sarah, your question is exactly where I'm going next. Um, so if we, if we have five years on our side, then this is the type of planning we're gonna do. We're gonna typically set up this type of trust, put some money in it. In some cases, maybe we'll put real estate, right? What if we have a, a vacation home in Michigan, right? The only house that is exempt when we have a married couple is, is the homestead, is the house that the husband or wife that's not applying for Medicaid lives in. So if there's a second home somewhere, in some cases, we'll transfer that house to this trust. In some cases, as long as the house is paid off, if it's not paid off, it's harder to do. But if the house is paid off, in some cases, we will actually take the, house, the, the homestead, even if, if it's the only property, and put it into this asset protection trust. Because that way, five years down the road, whether one or both of the, the husband or wife needs Medicaid, the house would be a protected asset that they could you know, pass on to their kids or their grandkids or whoever they want it to go to. Okay, Because again, while the house is a protected asset, if there's a married couple, the house is not protected in the event that it's a, it's a single person applying for Medicaid, right? It's one of the first things we discussed. So what happens if we don't have five years on our side, which are, which unfortunately is probably the majority of work we do uh, when it comes to putting, using these trusts. So we actually use the same type of trust, okay? But here, but we do things a lot differently. So when we don't have five years on our side, I want to be clear, it's typically either that we have five years or we are on the doorsteps of applying for Medicaid. There's no in between, okay? There's no, you know, my husband's at home with a caregiver. He's going to be moving. He's, we know that he'll be moving into a nursing home in six months. Can we, can we do this planning now? No, we can maybe prep for it, but we really can't do the planning until we're actually in the nursing home, okay? And here's how it works. Um, and I've, based on my next meeting, I've got a hard stop at 10.20. And normally, this is normally scheduled till 10.15. I can go a few minutes more. I definitely will not be able to take any more questions, guys. I just want to make sure we get through this information. So what happens here is I'm going to the nursing home. My wife's at home. And she goes and sits down with an attorney and says, I'm, I'm worried. Matt's in a nursing home. It's going to be $10,000 a month. We have $500,000, a house, and a car. What can we do? Right? So... If, if we know that if my wife does nothing, if she does nothing, basically, you know, between my care and her month and her monthly expenses, we won't be able to apply for Medicaid for me until she's down to $109,000, the house and the car, right? So if we do nothing at all, 
there's about four hundred thousand dollars at risk, right? Let's just use a, a, a nice even number, right? It could be three hundred, three hundred ninety technically. Let's just say four hundred thousand at risk. So what can we do? Well, what we do is we set up this exact same trust I just talked about, this Medicaid Asset Protection Trust. And what's going to happen is my wife and I are going to gift. Okay, you heard me. We're going to gift on purpose, two hundred thousand dollars, roughly. Okay, just to make this this easy. We're going to get roughly gift two hundred thousand dollars to this trust. Okay, of the four hundred that's at risk, right? Because she gets to keep a hundred in her name. So we're not talking about that. That's that's on the side. We don't need to do anything special for her to keep that. So of the four hundred thousand that's at risk, we gift half of it to the trust. That two hundred thousand dollar gift is going to trigger a penalty, right? We all know that, and we know that if the cost of care is ten thousand dollars a month, Medicaid is going to say, "Hey, Matt, you gave away twenty months worth of care." But we still have that other $200,000. So that other $200,000 that we need to move around so that we can apply for Medicaid for me, that other $200,000 goes to a Medicaid, goes into a Medicaid compliant annuity. Now, my disclaimer, I am not insurance salesman. I am not insurance licensed. I don't sell any insurance products or annuities or anything like that. And in fact, I typically don't like annuities in a lot of cases for some of my older clients because I feel like they are improperly sold to them. Um, that's a whole other talk. Okay. Um, so this is not a, this is not the type of annuity that, you know, I look at as, as, as a bad thing. What this annuity is going to do, it's called a single premium immediate annuity. We call it a SPIA for short. Okay. So if anybody wants to look it up, it's, a, it's called a single premium immediate annuity. Okay. And it's Medicaid compliant. So there's details that make it Medicaid compliant. For purposes of our conversation, we're not going to go down that road. Here's what happens. I take the $200,000 and I put it into that Medicaid compliant annuity. This is not a gift. All I'm doing is repurposing, if you will, money that was money, assets that put me over the limit, put that put my wife and I over the limit that would allow me to apply for Medicaid. And I'm turning it into an income stream. And what this annuity is going to do is it's going to make 20 equal monthly payments to me. Okay. Now there's, it's not, it's not just a coincidence that it's going to make 20 payments to me. And the penalty that Medicaid gave us is 20 months. Right. So the way this annuity is going to be going to work out is that the annuity payment each month for those 20 months, coupled with my monthly income, my wife and I's monthly income will be enough to pay the nursing home for 20 months for the penalty that we created on purpose when we gifted the $200,000 to the trust. Okay, I'm gonna repeat all this. We gifted $200,000 to the trust. This money is protected. This money is off the table for Medicaid. So now my wife gets her 109,000, the house and the car, plus we've got this additional $200,000 in the trust that we would not have otherwise. But when we made that $200,000 gift, because my monthly cost of care is 10,000 a month, Medicaid's going to give us a 20 month penalty, right? Because they said, Matt, when you gave away 200,000, you basically gave away 20 months worth of care at the nursing home that you're in. And so to make up for that penalty, we use this annuity. And it sounds weird. People can't get over this and they say, well, why can't we just pay out of pocket for 20 months? Why do we have to put it in this annuity? It's because for the penalty period to start, we need to be down to the 109,000 in my wife's name and the 2,000 in my name. And so we need to have that money out of our name. It's gotta be out of our name. So we've gotta give it to the insurance company. It sounds crazy, right? It's like me giving the money to my brother and then he's giving it right back to me. It's just how it has to work, okay? But I can't give it to my brother, right? Cause that would be a gift. So we give it to the insurance company. We have an annuity put in place and they're gonna give, they're gonna give it right back to us. Now, because we have monthly income coming in, in a lot of cases, I'll be honest, typically we're able to put anywhere between, you know, 55 and 60 to 70% of that 400,000 into the trust. And then a smaller percentage would go into the annuity because, you know, I, I might have $2,000 a month of income. I might, my wife might have $2,500 a month of income. And, and all of that gets factored into the calculations as to how we figure out how much goes into the trust and how much goes into the annuity. Again, for purposes of our call today, easier to look at this as a 50-50 plan, 
knowing that we're probably able to protect a little bit more than 50%. What happens in this situation is that once we get the 200,000 to the trust, we put the money in the annuity. My wife's down to 109,560, the house and the car. I've got $2,000 in my name. And by the way, in this example, if the house was in both of our names, we actually have to transfer it from the two of us to my wife only. And my name, you know, cannot be, you know, if my name's on a joint account with my wife, then, you know, my name can be on as many bank accounts as we want it to be, but those accounts cannot total more than 2,000. So we've got, to, we've got to put all those accounts in my wife's name only. Once this happens, where we put the money in the trust, we set up the annuity, now we apply for Medicaid. The 20-month penalty starts. The annuity kicks in. After 20 months, there's no money left in the annuity. And Medicaid is going to cover me moving forward. Um, so I will... I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Because I said I have until 1020, I'm happy to field questions until 1019, and then I'll let Karen take a minute to, to close us out. Um, so does anybody have any questions? <laughs> and I know that was a lot. I know that was a lot that I just gave you guys at the end there. Um, Vicky so, has a question. Vicky, yeah, I just saw that. Oh, sorry. Vicky, will you unmute so that you can ask Matt your question, and then Gloria? Okay, you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so if the house is 400,000, but I have equity loan for like, for example, 100,000. So my net asset you're talking about is 300,000, right? Do they, do they calculate my asset that way? So your, the house is an exempt asset. So you can have the house in addition to 109,000. So your house can be worth 500,000 or 800,000 and it can be totally paid off and you can still keep the house and the 109,000. But what I will say that we've done in situations is we've had clients where they still carry a mortgage on their home in this situation, but they've got $400,000 in cash. Mm. Well, what we will advise is we'll, we'll say, pay off the mortgage. Mm. If you've got $100,000 outstanding on the mortgage, pay it all off because mm -hmm. your house is exempt. Right, might as well tuck that money into the house because that's your asset down the road that Medicaid's not going to take. Mm, I see. Okay, thanks, Gloria. So, can you have um, a revocable trust and an irrevocable trust? And can you, um, over time, shift some money from your revocable trust into your irrevocable trust? Great question. Yes, you can. Um, in a lot of cases, we will. If we're doing the pre-planning, you know, five years in advance, a lot of times we will recommend creating both because whatever we're not going to put in the irrevocable trust to protect, we typically still want it in a revocable trust so that it's got probate protection. Um, what we typically advise, uh, I, my, our goal typically with clients is we would much prefer one lump sum gift at some point or that we, we do all the gifting of assets into the irrevocable trust, you know, in a very similar, in a very close time frame. Otherwise, you know, if we're gifting, you know, twenty five thousand dollars here, fifty thousand there, seventy five thousand there, over the course of the years, it's not an issue. But you know, if I gift fifty thousand dollars today, it's not protected until five years from today. And if I put seventy five thousand dollars in six months from today, that seventy five thousand isn't going to be protected until five years from that date. So it just, if we do that, that's fine. We just have to be sure that we're keeping pretty good records of this so that we know when it comes time to apply for Medicaid, what we did and, and when, when certain gifts were made. And, and just so we have an idea of, is it going to be countable? Is it going to, be, is it going to fall within the last five years? So I hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right. Um, and I'm going to cut you off, Matt, because I know you want to be able to answer all the questions, but it is 1019. And I know you have a hard cutoff time. And since Matt is willing to do this every single month, for the North Suburban YMCA. I wanna be very respectful of his time. We don't pay him. Um, he just does this out of the goodness of his heart. So Matt, thank you for joining us. Everyone else, thank you for joining us. Matt did include his, his email address in the chat box. However, if you don't have access to the chat box, um, you can email me, uh, Karen Brownlee, the person you registered with if you registered for this program. 
uh, or just look me up on the WISE website. You can email me and I will give you Matt's information so that you can reach out to him. Thank you, Matt, very much for your time. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, as usual, a wonderful program, Matt. I hope you all got what you wanted out of it. But again, if you didn't, feel free to reach out to Matt or to me and get the information you need. Again, thanks everybody. Have a Thank great you. day. Thanks guys. Happy New Year. Thank you very much. Yes.